Good afternoon, everyone. And I welcome you to the third day of the 13th edition of APJ Kolkata Literary Festival. Yes, we are on the last day of the literary festival that is Kolkata's first and India's only literary festival curated by a bookstore, the Oxford Bookstore. In our first session for today, titled Her Master's Work, we have with us the multi-talented novelist, performance poet, journalist, and musician, Jeet Thai. His first novel, Narcobolis, was shorted for the Man Booker Prize and won a DSC Prize for South Asian Literature. Today, Jeet Thai will introduce his latest book, Names of the Women. Names of the Women is an extraordinary work of restoration, playful invention, and stark beauty. Published by Penguin, this fascinating novel explores female characters in the New Testament who have been marginalized and misrepresented by the history. I will leave it right here and hand over session to the author himself, Jeet Thai. Over to you, sir. Thanks so much, Shantari. It's a pleasure to be here at the APJ Kolkata Literary Festival. And uh, just a reminder, this book that I will be reading from, uh, Names of the Women, it's available at the um, the Oxford Bookstore, which is the organizer of the festival, as I'm sure you all uh, will immediately remember. So I'm going to uh, read a, a couple of pages from uh, Names of the Women, and the opening section that I'm going to read is a... Uh, it's from the point of view of uh, a character called Old Mary, who is the mother of James and Salome, and she's a very minor character in the Bible, uh, as are most of the 15 women in this book. Um, this is just a way of trying to uh, understand what it is that made the women in the New Testament um, the, the true followers of Christ and uh, the bravest of, of his followers. The wind picks up, flinging sand in circles around the street. She spits to the side and wipes her face with her hands and puts her fingers into her tangled gray hair to dislodge the grit. Then the wind stands up in earnest and a dust storm whips her. She shields her eyes with her veil, but the sand finds its way into her clothes and hair. The women huddle together and wait for the storm to pass, their eyes squeezed shut, veils tight around their heads. The soldiers form a ring around the Christ. They know nothing about the man they are punishing, she thinks. They don't know that he has no wish to escape. More than they, it is he who wants to see this story through to its bloody, mythic end. It's clear to her that no one is more complicit in the death of Jesus than Jesus himself. When the storm dies down a little, the soldiers push on. She stumbles and grabs blindly for Mary of Magdala. And the two women walk steadily against the wind. Then, as suddenly as it began, the storm falls out and all is as before. There's no sign of its passing, but a film of sand that covers the city. This is when she sees the birds, dozens of mockingbirds and sunbirds and birds she doesn't know the names of, small knots of feathers dropped on the road around her. She picks one up, soft and dust colored, small as her thumb and already stiffening. Its wire claws point at the sky. By her feet, she sees more small bundles, a wash of them. And this is another terrible thing on a day of terrible things, unimaginable occurrences, bitter omens of catastrophe, birds fallen dead from the sky. She puts the creature down with its claws facing to the side. Then, shivering, she joins the other women. She feels herself moving between the world she has always known. 
the clean edges of things that have been a part of her life since she was a child and the world that is to come. A world of fear that blots out the sunlight. When she was young, her father would tell her about other lands, that the earth was a vast place and its exact dimensions could only be imagined, that nobody knew how deep the oceans went or how high the sky. Today, on a day when she has gone further into the world than she ever thought possible, she senses her father reaching out to her in the shape of hands made of sand, a storm figure seeking to embrace her. At the last moment, just as it seems he would touch her, after hours and years of reaching, he falls to the ground and breaks into particles, a film of dust or a handful of dead feathers flung from the sky. <coughs> Excuse me. When they reach the hill and the hammering begins, she loses all sense of herself. Hours must have passed. The light has leaked out of the evening. She sees that they've nailed the crossbeam to a plank of timber already planted in the ground. They position his limbs as if they're handling a suit of clothes. He doesn't struggle or cry out. He offers no resistance. And so it's over quickly. The roping of his arms to the cross her visions brighten and she feels she's coming up with a fever. Against the promise she made to herself, she looks away when the first nail is hammered into the small of his wrist, his slender wrist that will shred against the iron before long. She looks away and her thoughts roam where they will. And for some reason, she remembers the Canaanite. She was 10 or nine. She and her sister were playing at the front of the house when the man approached. Their favorite game, rolling a wooden lion past the gates of a city they had made out of stones. The lion stood on a board attached to big wooden wheels and as he rolled down the small main street of the town, the townspeople screamed in terror. Some among them didn't scream, but surrendered meekly as if to a new god. She was so engrossed that she didn't look up when the visitor shuffled past. All she noticed was that his feet were cracked at the heels, cracked so deep they might have been made by a butcher's knife, and that he was told to come to the back of the house. She stopped playing lion and went inside. Her father stood impassively at the back porch, staring at the visitor. The man sat in the noon sun, near their fields of white barley, his eyes on the meal he'd been given. He was eating from a plate her family did not use. She asked why the man had not been welcomed into the house, and her father explained that he was a Canaanite. She asked him what that meant, and her father said, he is the slave of slaves. She looked carefully at the man. It would show on his face, she thought. His condition would show in his eyes or his nose. There would be markings and ceremonial slave scars. His hair would be unusual, and his skin, and his manner of speaking and eating. But she could see no difference between him and her father except that her father's clothes were finer and his skin was fairer. Otherwise, they could have been enemies. Sorry, otherwise they could have been cousins. Before the man left, her father took a pitcher of water to him and the man cupped his hands and drank. He washed his face and thanked them for the food and left as silently as he'd come. For some reason, she remembers him now, the Canaanite, as she hears a sound like the splintering of wood and looks up to see a soldier driving a long square nail into the sweet bones of his feet. Grunts of pleasure from the Romans and Jews scattered about the hillside. They've been waiting for this moment. Their faces, like the face of the woman from the temple, are unremarkable in every way except one. 
they know to hide the emotion that fills them. She wonders if there will come a day when those who believe only in the rule of the sword, in destroying the outsider and the stranger, will give up their power over those who believe in kindness. Otherwise, why does he suffer on the cross? And what meaning is there in his death? She hears the grunts of pleasure and cries of shame and anguish from those who are gathered at the base of the cross. Dizzy, she tilts her head and looks up and notices that his lips are moving. What is he saying? She hears the name Mary, but it is not she who is being addressed. She is old Mary, mother of James and Salome. Thank you. Is there anybody out there? There are some questions coming in, Jeet. Okay. okay. Uh, we could take one or two now, or I can read some poems. Whichever well, you we could take them at the end. Sure, I'll get to the poems. Uh, I'm going to read some new and newish poems. Uh, these were all written in the last year or two. And some of them actually in the last couple of months, like this one, which is uh, titled Old. <clears throat> the word went first, not the meaning, but the word. Before sight, before hearing, my hands continued their work, but without the exaltation, black carved into white became an insect's crawl across the wall. Markings on a scroll buried in a jar, cuneiform from future Sumerians, never to be unearthed or deciphered. Like St. Gregory at the end, how he'd take out his dentures, slam them on the table and say, nothing false in the mouth. Just so, when I spoke, I could not hear my voice. The hush was too deep, and I was not too far gone to know the nature of the silence that became my boon companion. The wings of the angel of the end near me, near mine, lined the boys with quicklime, the air with tar and carbon, and then the trees fell like birds into the understanding that we are not benefactors, but gods, gleeful and mad, who pull the world down around us to sleep, sheets tangled at our feet. This is called February 2020, it's a guzzle. The climate's in crisis. To breathe is to ache in India. Too cold or too hot, we freeze and bake in India. They police our thoughts, our posts, our clothes, our food. The news and the government is fake in India. Beat the students bloody, then file a case against them. Criminals in power know the laws to break in India. Pick up the innocent and lynch them on a whim. Minorities will be taught how to partake in India. Hamde Kenge, the poet Fez once said, but if you say it, you're anti-national. You have no stake in India. Women and students and poets, they are the enemy. Come here, dear, we'll show you how to shake in India. The economy's bust, jobs are few, the poor are poorer. 
question is, how much more can we take in India? When you say your prayers, make sure you pick the right God. Petitions to the wrong one, you must forsake in India. Jeet, if you don't like it, amnesia and uh, for some strange reason Donald Trump um, makes an appearance in one of the stanzas I can't remember why my line breaks this way in November I cracked the day to see what might fall out a congealed yellow sky mistake became in December, I saw trees in flame, a bat with a double snout. The president likes pain. He's a big guy with a small, strange mushroom for penis and brain. The colors change. Everywhere is the same. I can't remember when I grew these fins. Was it now or then? Did we sink or swim? Hi, honey. What's your name? This is called The Rose. It's uh, probably the most, one of the most recent poems uh, from this suite of poems. Beside me, the rose raises her middle finger. See how she throws love into the ringer. Outside, the city wakes with a start. Don't call this art, call it absence of pity. The rose at the window moistens her lips. Buds of apocalypse sail up her Thou cease. I'm a lucky dog. I'm so easy to please. And the last one for this reading, it's called A Kind of Anthem. A nation you thought you knew, from Ashoka to Buddha to Gandhi to Nehru, in a single decade unravels into Muslim, Christian, Hindu, unholy trinity of saffron, green and blue on a field of British white. My girlfriend's Chinese, my baby mama's a Jew, my husband's red, white and blue. When we are out on the toot in Chikmagalur, Dew or Kathmandu, there's no jealousy or rue, we try to eat right. We like our new brew. We float past our differences and accrue credit for the next bardo, our karmic due. Either way, it's true. We're dead if we don't and dead if we do. Got a light? Thanks. That's, uh, that's it for me. Um, I guess I can take a question. You've got the questions there, Jeet, if you can uh, take them in the chat. Sure, yeah. Um, maybe maybe you should read it out so people have a context what the question is. Yes, yes. Go ahead. Someone from the audience asked, um, Jeet, sir, how do the multiple personalities of a poet, an author, a performer blend into each other and influence your writing? Um, first of all, it really uh, makes me very anxious to be called sir. I'm always looking over my shoulder wondering who's being addressed. Uh, you know, you think that the police are after you or something. Uh, so 
it just give me a second to collect my thoughts uh what was the question again how do the multiple personalities of a poet an author a performer blend into each other and influence your writing thanks um you know it really depends on what i'm doing of a day like if on the same day or on consecutive days i'm doing a uh, poetry and fiction or uh, say working on a song very often images sometimes even lines will bleed from one uh endeavor or discipline into another and i always um find that a very useful kind of bleed because uh it leads to unexpected resonances and uh unexpected um ideas sometimes that arise um almost from your unconscious and i'm always grateful for that and uh, it's also useful because if you if say if you get stuck on a novel you're working on um i find it helpful to just forget it for a while try and forget about it for a while and uh move to poetry and uh that way you kind of replenish and you recharge your batteries and then you can come back to the thing to the long form thing that you're working on and uh, i find it it's mutually beneficial actually the next question is from anirudh mishra who says big fan of narcopolis here who's the poet jeet's favorite writer and author jeet's favorite poet god there's such a long list um such a long list that uh, if i were to uh, you know kind of start ticking off names from that list we're going to be here all day so i'm going to spare you that and uh maybe just say that um at the moment uh, i've been reading a lot of poetry because uh, in fact a lot of indian poets and indian in quotes because i've been putting together an anthology the Peng- penguin book of modern indian poets which will be out in india in april and it's uh, going to press uh, uh, it's going to bed at least um next week so i've been reading a lot of poetry from indian poets from india and all over the world and it's just been uh, a th- thrilling thing to do and, and uh, if you want to know who the poets are grab the book when it's out in april poets okay um so last question thank um thank to 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 quote ariana thank you next sorry i interrupted you uh ala no 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 problem so the last um question that we'd like to take here is a request uh from anushri bala who says can you read your poem the penitent for us oh Do sure you have it oh. yeah yeah sure this is from these errors are correct and it's also in the collective poems the penitent i'm back when my life and i parted ways i'm talking to the coffee maker to the face towels folded by the sink to the air conditioner that conspires with my enemies even now in the midst of my extremity my eyes are dry and if i jump repeatedly against the window i can tell myself i'm being lifted by a great joy until the glass smites my face and i cry out your old name the room is empty lonely as a still life but the water stains speak with your voice honor me honor everything Thank you for asking me to read that. I forgotten I wrote it.
Thank you so much, Jeet. It was pleasure having you at APJ Kolkata Literary Festival, and we look forward to hosting you for a in-person, on-ground event for the next edition. Real pleasure being here. Thank, Thank you so much for asking me. Thanks.